Good morning, everybody. Morning. Again, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Awesome. Thank you. I want to welcome you all to a MS Views and News educational program. We are doing these events now in 27 states. I know we were here, I think, for our first time in Cincinnati. It was about five years ago. And at that time, we were only doing programs in five states. But again, we are now doing this in 27 states. And we are very heavily, this year, reaching places in true rural America. Um, for today's program, we want to thank two of the pharmaceutical companies that supported us to be able to do this program today, and that is Celgene and Novartis, and I hope that you all can thank them as well. Hoo-hoo, give them a rah-rah, go. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. All right, today's program, we have Dr. Gary Owens from Delaware, and then we have Dr. Aaron Boster. Now, each of them are going to give uh, 45 or 50-minute presentations, and then we'll open up to Q&A. All right, so let's, uh, let me get into introducing Dr. Aaron Boster. And for those that don't know Dr. Aaron Boster, wow, you've missed out on a lot over the years. A lot, lot. I mean, all you got to do is get onto his YouTube channel and see all of his videos that he does, like, every day. I mean, you got to wonder when this guy sleeps, right? And then I find out he's got an archive of over, a, like, a thousand videos to still release. It's pretty ridiculous, all right? Um, but anyway, Dr. Boster is, um, you know, we had him at our first program here in Cincinnati. I don't know if anybody was here for that program. All right, I see hands going up. That's great. So I remember, you know, we had, we had a lot of people in the room, and Dr. Boster did not know we needed him on the stage. All right, and Dr. Boster takes the microphone, and he goes to run out into the audience to, like, say hello to everybody, and I screamed out, no, you know, because our cameras can't show the audience. All right, and he didn't know that, but he knows that this time. So you're going to see him doing cartwheels up uh, up here, all right? And um, and and it'll just be different. But for those that don't know, Dr. Aaron Boster is the administrator. He's the lead uh, neurologist at Ohio Health MS. And um, you know, there's just too much for me to be to put it into words to say. I'm sure that you all know about him. He's got quite a name in the in the community. He's going to speak for us at many locations. You know, as we go into 2020 and even finishing 2019. So let's give a big round of applause to Dr. Boster. Come on. You go for Duke. <laughs> Howdy. Howdy. That was not too shabby. I always worry right after a big meal. Now, I do want to do that one more time, but I'll be honest, I was very impressed by that. This is our very first audience participation where I say something and you respond. One more time, guys, get ready. Howdy! Howdy. Oh, yeah! Thank you very much for having me. Let me give a strong and warm shout out to MS Views and News. Can we give them a round of applause for putting this together? <laughs> Who here appreciated the education that we just received? Thank you. My name is Aaron Boster, and it is an absolute pleasure to talk to you about multiple sclerosis today. I decided to become an MS doctor at age 12. My uncle had had MS for many, many years at that point. He was fixed in a wheelchair. He was in the living room when I came to visit my grandmother. My grandmother and my mother were sitting at the kitchen table holding hands and crying. They weren't crying because Uncle Mark had MS. They were crying because he had a problem and they couldn't reach their doctor. Nobody wants to watch their mom cry. I promised my mother that I would learn to do it better than the men taking care of my uncle. I didn't know what I was promising my mom. I didn't know that I would be bald by the time I finished my training or I would complete the 27th grade of school. I knew that no one should ever make a family that scared and feel that alone and that helpless. And that set me on a very unusual trajectory. I was the weirdo in high school that said, I would like to be an MS doctor when I grow up. I chose my college because of its neuroscience program. I declared in my first week of medical school here at University of Cincinnati that I was going to be a neuroimmunologist. I moved my family to a state up north I'm not allowed to talk about, 
so that I could seek specific training and I did extra fellowship training so that I could crush this disease. I moved back to my hometown of sunny Columbus, Ohio and it has been a singular mission of mine for the last 12 or 13 years, I start to lose count, of beating up on multiple sclerosis. Today, I thought I would talk to you about how to make MS boring. What do you think? Show of hands. Should we talk about how to make MS boring? Can I get an amen? amen? Thank you. Let's talk about that. I want to start by talking about what MS is. Can we do that for a brief second? What is multiple sclerosis? In order to understand MS, we first have to appreciate the immune system. The immune system is the part of our body that fights off foreign invaders. The immune system is made up of a bunch of little white blood cells that live inside the bone marrow. And when they are born, they're, they don't know what they're going to do in life. They're kind of like college freshmen. They're not sure just yet. And they go to school up at T-Cell University in the thymus. Now, T-Cell University is a wackadoodle school. It's not like the schools I'm used to. First of all, it's completely free to go to T-Cell University. So we know we're not talking about a traditional American college. At T-Cell University, there's only one class. Can you differentiate self versus non-self? If I show you one of your own cells, can you say, well, hello, me. How are, how are me today? And if I show you a virus, a bacteria, a parasite, a fungus, can you identify it as a bad guy? Now, when you graduate from T-Cell University, there's only one profession, literally soldier. And those cells tool around in the human body and they check everybody out. And when they see one of their own cells, they give it a high five. And when they see a foreign invader, they stop what they're doing. They get out their iPhone 10 and they take a picture of it. They text it to all their friends. So now the human has a memory of that foreign invader for the life of the human being. Then when their friends arrive, they quite literally stomp it to death. For the remainder of that human's life, every time that virus enters the human body, the immune system is ready and primed and waiting. If someone tells you that you can't get chicken pox twice, they're lying. You can get chicken pox hundreds of times. The second time you get chicken pox, your immune system has been waiting since you were 16 to whomp on it and it clears that virus. But let's go back to T-Cell University up in the thymus. What happens at T-Cell University if you fail the class? I told you it was a weird school. They take you out back and shoot you. Only cells that can differentiate self versus non-self are allowed to survive. Theoretically, all the immune cells can do this important thing. But every once in a while, the immune system makes an error in judgment. A student takes the test, fails the class, and they don't take him out back and shoot him. And he graduates with all of his buddies, not understanding the difference between self and non-self. He's graduated to become a soldier. He gets weapons just like his friends, and he starts running around the human body, and he sees what he thinks is a foreign invader. But it's not. It's part of him. And he does what he was trained to do. He gets out his iPhone 10 and takes a picture of it. He texts the picture to all of his friends saying, this is a bad guy. And for the remainder of the human being's life, every time the immune response sees that part of you, it thinks it's looking at a foreign invader and it does what it was trained to do and it stomps on it. That, my friends, is autoimmunity. When the immune system makes an error in judgment and attacks part of you thinking it's a bad guy. There are a lot of autoimmune conditions. What do we call the condition where the immune system attacks the pancreas and jacks up your ability to make insulin? Diabetes, that's exactly right. That's an autoimmune condition that affects the pancreas. What do we call the condition where the immune system attacks the joints of the body? Right. Rheumatoid arthritis, that's an autoimmune condition. Multiple sclerosis is also an autoimmune condition. It's an autoimmune condition that attacks the holiest of holies, the supercomputer that runs the body, the brain. It's an autoimmune condition that attacks the superhighway, the spinal cord that takes all the information from the brain back down to your feet and back up. And untreated or undertreated, multiple sclerosis is the leading cause of neurological disability amongst young people. Did you know that? Untreated, MS causes brain damage and can lead to cognitive and physical disability. Today, I'm going to talk about how we kick MS in the teeth. Today, I'm going to teach you my recipe 
for making MS boring. I am asked not infrequently, hey, Dr. B, when are we going to cure multiple sclerosis? I stand before you humbly. It is my opinion that we will not cure MS in my lifetime. Now, please understand, I would love to be wrong. That would be super duper. But it's my belief that our understanding of the immune response is too infantile to have that be a goal. But you know what is a very realistic goal? Making it boring. Remember how we talked about diabetes? Diabetes used to be a death sentence. Literally, people that develop diabetes would go into kidney failure and they would pass. Nowadays, you don't even know that your girlfriend has diabetes unless you happen to share chocolate cake at lunch. And she gets in her purse and pulls out a little pen and injects herself and says, honey, what are you doing? Oh, don't worry, darling, I'm giving myself my insulin. Done right, done right, diabetes is boring. Now, I want you to have excitement in the boardroom. I want you to have a lot of excitement in the bedroom. I want you to have excitement on the playing field. I want you to be bored to pieces when you come to see me in clinic. And whereas I regretfully share, I don't think we're going to cure MS in my lifetime. Done right, we can make MS boring right now. What do you say? Yeah. Does that sound right? Can I get an amen? amen? Let's talk about how do we make MS boring. There are three elements to the recipe to make MS boring. There are three things that we want to do to make MS boring. So let's talk about all three. Number one, treating attacks. An attack, a flare, an exacerbation, a relapse, it's all the same thing. Now the fancy pants scientific medical definition of a relapse is a new or worsening neurological condition that has occurred over a period of 24 to 48 hours, preceded by 30 days of quiet in the absence of a fever. Blah! That's a lot of words. Let's translate that into English. What is an attack? An attack is when something bad happens to you, and after a couple days, you can't hide it from your wife, and you have to admit that you can't see out of your left eye. An attack, pathologically, is when the aberrant, naughty autoimmune response crosses from the bloodstream into the central compartment, where it sees part of the supercomputer, attacks it, and short circuits part of your brain. And wherever that short circuit occurred, that neurological function doesn't work very well. That's an attack. Attacks are caused by focal inflammation. So if, let me give you an example. Let's pretend that you got really upset with me and took off those cute shoes and threw it and smacked me in the face. Now, please don't. That was just an example. She's like, all right, right now I won't do that. And so she smacks me in the face and my cheek gets all puffy. Is it gone tomorrow? That's a question I ask and you answer. Is the swelling, no, it's not gone tomorrow. In fact, tomorrow it's even more swollen. Why? Inflammation occurs subacutely. It builds up over hours to days, and then it gets better over weeks to months. If you punched me on my face, that would happen because of inflammation. If I have an MS attack in my holiest of holies, my brain, same thing. MS attacks occur, they ramp up over hours to days, they peak, and then they get better slowly over time, typically over weeks to months. An MS attack can occur in any part of the brain or spinal cord. If you ask me, could MS cause blank? The answer is yes, because the brain controls all the stuff we do. So it actually is a rough question. And most commonly, we see attacks that impact the nerves that run the eyes. And so the nerve that runs the eye receives light that goes in the back of the brain and translate it in the computer to tell you what you're looking at. And if you have inflammation of the nerve that runs the eye, you can't get the light back there. And the result is you can't see very well. And by the way, as that nerve gets swollen and you move your eye around, it hurts like the dickens, doesn't it? What am I talking about? I'm talking about optic neuritis. Ever heard of optic neuritis? Yeah, many of you may have. And so optic neuritis is a very common attack presentation. What's another common attack presentation? Transverse myelitis. Now that's a doctor word, isn't it? Milo is a different language called Greek, which means cord, Milo. Itis means inflammation, like bursitis or bronchitis. So myelitis is when you have inflammation of the spinal cord. That's the superhighway. Transverse means it affects both sides, doesn't have to be equal, and typically presents when the down there's don't work. You're familiar with the down there's. Bowel, bladder, sexual function, leg function, feeling, motor function of the legs. And someone can wake up and their feet are really weirdly numb. 
and over the next day or two, it kind of creeps up their leg and they have a little trouble controlling their bladder. That's called transverse myelitis. Transverse myelitis is a second common presentation of an MS attack, a flare, an exacerbation, a relapse. The third most common presentation of an MS attack is brainstem function. All the stuff in your face is run by your brain, and actually the base of your brain called the brain stem. You have all these nerves that control the eyes going up and down and moving left and right, and speaking and swallowing and sensation of the face and all that other kind of stuff. Even your sense of balance, it's all controlled there. And the third most common presentation of MS attack is a brainstem syndrome. Now, there are a myriad of other things that can present with an MS attack. And it strikes me that we don't always know as the human being what's what. I'll make a point. Please get into your wallet or your purse and pull out your body handbook. Get it out real quick. I need to look at page 27. Get out your body handbook. Nobody's reaching in their purse. Nobody's, you know why? Because we're not born with a body handbook, right? We don't have a manual on page 37 that says here's how the brain works and if this thing happens, it's an attack. We don't have that information. We live our lives prospectively going forward minute by minute as we experience life. And when you wake up in the morning and you can't feel your leg, did you sleep on it funny? Did you bust a blood vessel? Did you break it last night? Do you have an MS attack? You don't know. All you know is, gosh darn it, you can't feel your leg. And so I want to teach you the 24 hour rule, right? The 24 hour rule, which would be in the handbook on page 37 if I had one, is that MS attacks last longer than a day. Why do I share that with you? Because any rational human being who is given a chronic diagnosis, doesn't matter the diagnosis, could be cancer, God forbid, could be diabetes, could be rheumatoid arthritis, could be MS. If a rational human being is given a chronic diagnosis and their nose itches, they're gonna ask a rational question. Is the itchy nose related to that condition that I was just told I have, right? That is a normal human being response. And if you don't know the 24 hour rule, it might drive you bonkers. And so I want you to ask the question. I woke up, my nose is itching. I want you to say to yourself, hey self, how long has it gone on for? And if the answer is less than 24 hours, I'm not as worried about it. If it's gone on longer than 24 hours, I want you to phone a friend. And what am I talking about? I'm talking about calling your clinician. Now, I chose those words carefully, all right? Because I need you to be seen by a human being if you have a new neurological symptom lasting longer than 24 hours because you don't have the tools to sort out if the symptom that you're dealing with is an attack or something else. And let me explain what I mean. One of the common phenomena in MS is that people are at risk of getting urinary tract infections, which is a bummer. Burns when you urinate, you got a foul smell, the down there is kind of hurt, have trouble controlling the bladder, sometimes can't get to the bathroom in time, a urinary tract infection. And when you have a urinary tract infection, many people with MS aren't even fully aware of it. It's called an occult urinary tract infection. They're not aware of it. And your body, in an attempt at fighting that UTI, raises your core body temperature because viruses and bacteria don't handle elevations in body temperature. Raise your core body, not enough that you have a fever, but if you had an internal thermometer, it would raise it by about one degree. That's enough to short circuit old areas of damage. You had an optic neuritis back in the day, 20 years ago. You get a urinary tract infection, raise your core body temperature and short circuit your eye. You don't know that it's a reemergence of an old symptom. That's actually called something special in MS. That's called a pseudo attack. Pseudo is Greek for similar to, but it ain't. Pseudo attack is where you have the reemergence of an old neurological symptom in the setting of a fever. And you as the human being might not know what's up. I will not call in high dose steroids on the telephone. <coughs> It makes some of my patients upset. Dr. B, come on, I know I'm having an attack. Do I really have to drive all the way down the clinic and see you? Yeah, darling, you do. Because if I give you high dose steroids for a urinary tract infection, I'm gonna visit you in the hospital because I made the urinary tract infection worse. I need to get you in the clinic where I can do a proper neurological examination, where I can do some testing to rule out some common infections, and only then is it safe for me to treat that attack. Make sense? You're either very polite or I'm being really clear. <laughs> I'm gonna hope it's both. Um, how do we treat an attack? Well, first off, I think you need to be seen by your clinician. In my role, in my uh, job, I, I make uh, recommendations. 
right? I would like to call them rules, but that's not the way the institution works. I just make recommendations. And one of my recommendations is that if someone with MS calls with a new neurological complaint, they're seen by a human being within five business days. Now, in a perfect world, it would be the same day. But I, I practice medicine in the real world. And sometimes, despite my very best efforts, I can't get you in. And if that happens where I can't get you in, I tell you to go to your primary care doctor. She can call me. We can have a chit chat on the phone. But you need to be seen by a human being. And we need to make sure that we're crossing off some naughty things, like an upper respiratory tract infection or a fever or a urinary tract infection, et cetera. We also have to make sure that it's not something else. I'll give you a quick example. Patient called in and said, I, I can't feel my leg. It feels really funny. I'm having an attack. Can I have steroids? And we said, nuh uh. They came in. Their leg did feel funny. It was real big, it was red, it was swollen, it was hot. They had thrown a clot in their leg. Yeah, they had to have a special surgery that night. Yeah, they, they go on special blood thinning medication. Steroids would not treat that. And I'm grateful they were willing to listen and come in so that we could take care of them properly. So number one in treating an attack, <clears throat> if it goes on longer than 24 hours, <clears throat> sorry, talking about attacks makes me very emotional. First thing we want to do is we want to make sure that you're seen. We want to make sure that we've identified whether or not you're having a pseudo attack and that's addressed. Then we want to talk about how do we treat an attack. When you have an attack, we have options. Now, who's in charge of you? Me. Your wife. No, 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 no. Your mom. No, uh, you're in charge of you, right? You're, you're the owner of your body. You're in charge. And just because I want you to do X or Y doesn't mean you're going to. I have some patients that have told me candidly, Dr. B, I didn't call you about my attack because I didn't want you to make me take steroids. To which I said, I can't make my kids do stuff. <laughs> the other day I said, we got to go to bed by midnight. Well, that didn't happen. I thought it was a very reasonable request. I can't stay up past nine sometimes, right? My point here is I'm not going to make you do nothing. And if you are having an attack, we're going to have a conversation. Now, I would like to treat your attack, and I'm going to share why. Because we're talking about inflammation in the holiest of holies, the only untransplantable organ system. You can transplant hair. Why are you looking at me? Right? You can transplant your hand. You can transplant your face, actually. You can transplant your pancreas, your kidney, your liver. You can transplant your heart. You certainly can get a new bone, but you can't get a new brain. We don't, we don't have to do that yet. You can't get a new spinal cord. You get one of those, you're born with it, and you keep it until you die. And even then, it's still yours, really. And if you have damage to the holiest of holies, I can't give it back. It's brain damage. Let that sink in. We're talking about brain damage here. That's important to me. And so if you have inflammation, it's eating away at the tissue of your brain or your spinal cord. And I don't like that. I can make you get better faster by quelling inflammation. Remember a while ago when she threw her shoe at me and smacked me in the face and my face got all puffy? I could take an aspirin or an anti-inflammatory and I can quell the inflammation. It'll make my face get less swollen faster. And I might choose to do that. If I have inflammation impacting my eyeball and I can't see, I want to give you the MS equivalent of that aspirin to quell the inflammation to get it better faster. I was taught by my mentors that it doesn't make it more better, but it actually does because it can save tissue. And so I want to treat your attack. Now, I've had patients say, Doc, I, I don't want to do it, to which I say, okay, it's not my disease, it's your disease. We, you don't have to do it. It's not my job to be paternal. I went to University of Cincinnati Medical School just last year, huh? and, and they didn't have a class on paternalism. It's not my right nor privilege to inform you that you have to do something. It is my obligation ethically to teach you why I'm asking you and then to honor your decision. Is that a fair deal? Yes. There's a lot of different ways to treat attacks, all right? We, we use steroids. Now, I'm not talking about like steroids. No, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about bodybuilding anabolic steroids. I'm talking about a different kind of steroids called corticosteroids. Corticosteroids are like the end-all, be-all of anti-inflammation. If I use a gun analogy, forgive, and we think of an aspirin as a 22 pistol, the steroids I'm talking about are, are more like a bazooka, all right? And they need to be bazooka-esque because we have to quell inflammation inside the brain and spinal cord. 
Now, there are different flavors of steroids. The most commonly administered steroid is given IV in the vein, right? So you sit in a chair and they spike a vein and they run a drip in for an hour. And oftentimes we'll do that for five days in a row. But that's not the only way to give steroids. It is equally as effective to give steroids by pill, all right? And there are pills that are actually relatively inexpensive, all things considered, but they're disgusting tasting and you have to take 25 of them every morning. They accomplish the same goal. In fact, there's different flavors of pills. There's prednisone and dexamethasone and all these other kind of things. There's even special drugs that you can take by injection. My point is we can game out how to help you with your relapse lots of different ways. That's a discussion. Your obligation is not to become a neurologist. Your request is to bring it to our attention when you're having something new going on for more than 24 hours so that we can help you get better faster. Now, before I switch off the topic of relapse, we have to talk about something else. MS medicines. Now, I'm going to talk about this at the end, if Stuart gives me enough time, about MS medicines. But if you're taking an MS medicine, that's a birth control pill against the tax, right? Now, let me ask you a question. If you're a gal taking oral birth control pill and you get knocked up, guess what? It didn't work, right? If you're taking a form of contraception and you get pregnant, that form of contraception didn't do what you wanted it to, correct? If you're taking an MS medicine, the intention of the MS medicine is to prevent attacks. If you're taking the MS medicine the way you're supposed to and you had an attack, guess what? It didn't work. And that means that we need to have a conversation about if we stay on that drug. Now we might choose to stay on the drug, but we need to have a conversation about if we stay on the drug. Does that make sense? Why am I sharing that with you? Because you are your advocate. It's your body, you're your advocate. And when you go and see your clinician and you're being treated for an attack, I want you to say, hey doc, does this mean my drug's not working? Hey doc, should we talk about doing something different? And I am not suggesting the answer is always yes, I am suggesting we need to have the conversation. Is that fair? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Yes. That sounds reasonable? I told you today I was gonna teach you how to make MS boring. I told you there's three ways to do it. Way number one is to identify and treat attacks. Are you feeling the love? Yes. Shall we shift gears and talk about way number two? Yes. Can I get an amen? amen? All right, so now what we're going to talk about is treating symptoms. What is a symptom? That's a doctor word, right? A symptom. I have a symptom. There are three symptoms. These are the diagnosis of the various symptoms, blah, blah, blah. Symptoms are things that bother you. If you have an attack which manifests as right leg burning, your right leg feels like it's on fire. God forbid. And we treat it, maybe it only gets 80% better, which means when you're particularly tired, when you're overheated, when you have an infection, or if you're in church, your leg burns. And that's awful. Now, I have a pill for every ill. No, sir, it doesn't mean you don't get to go to church. I'm just saying it could happen there. He's like, honey, did you hear that? Sunday's off the leg. So I, tr I tried, all right, no worries. And so, if you're left with a 20% burning sensation, you're stuck with a chronic symptom. MS can cause a lot of symptoms. And if we slow your disease down and you're miserable, we didn't do the best job we could. Guess what? I don't do a bad job. In order to do the best job possible, I have to simultaneously slow your disease down and improve the quality of your life. I want to make the quality of your life better. And the easiest way to do that is to treat chronic symptoms. I literally have a pill for every ill. I'm going to give you a pill for every ill because you don't want to take a bunch of medicine. I don't want to write you a bunch of medicine. But if it bothers you enough, we need to talk about it. Now here's a tricky, tricky thing. Lots of MS is invisible. Lots of multiple sclerosis is invisible. Honey, you look so good. Oh, sweetie, you look so good. You don't look sick. Well, you don't look dumb. All right, so we were talking about symptoms, and I shared that a lot of symptoms are invisible, which is super frustrating. If you fall and break your arm and you get a cast, people will sign your cast. Dear so-and-so, I love you. I hope you feel better soon. And they'll carry your book bag for you, right? They might put your groceries in the car. 
But if you get overheated and you can't think clearly because of cog fog, nobody can see that. And honey, you look so good. So much of MS is invisible and we have to be open and honest about that. And so I thought I would spend a few minutes talking about symptoms, but in specific, talking about the triad of invisible symptoms. The triad of nasty, nasty that are the most common causes of people ha leaving work and having a poor quality of life and they're all invisible. Symptom number one, fatigue. How many people impacted by MS have had this conversation? Oh my God, I'm tired. And the person you're talking to is like, yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah. Oh, so here's the best I've come up with to help someone understand what MS fatigue is like. Go to work on Monday. Monday night, go home, have dinner, hang out with your family, and don't go to bed. Stay up all night. Binge Netflix or watch my YouTube channel. <laughs> Tuesday morning, you decide if you shower. I have nothing to do with that. Go to work, work all day Tuesday. Tuesday night, come home, hang out with your family, have dinner, finish watching the rest of my YouTube videos. Do not sleep Tuesday night. Wednesday, get up, go to work. I would like you to shower. <laughs> and then Wednesday after work, let's go for a walk and have a conversation. What do you think? Anybody in the room experienced some MS fatigue? Might that resonate? It's my hope to help people understand, I'm getting some head shakes, yes, that MS fatigue isn't, I'm a little tired. MS fatigue is crushing. It makes it so people can't stay awake. It's one of the two leading causes of loss of work by people in the United States with MS, is fatigue. And it's invisible. Second invisible symptom, cognitive fog. Cog fog, cognitive impairment. MS does not cause Alzheimer's dementia. I'm asked that question a lot. People with MS are not going to forget who their loved ones are, thank God. I guess depending on your loved ones. Um, but they're not going to forget that. They're, they're not going to forget how to tie their shoes. That's not the kind of cognitive fatigue I'm talking about. I'm talking about the ability to maintain a list in your head. Oftentimes, patients would tell me, I used to never need a list. Now I can't find my list. I'm serious. The kind of cognitive fatigue that I'm talking about is the inability to multitask or to work under pressure. I learned as an MS doctor one of the single hardest jobs, one of the very hardest jobs for someone that I take care of in clinic is telemarketer. Think about it. I have patients that are telemarketers. They sit in front of a computer. Oftentimes they have three screens. They're maintaining up to three or four conversations simultaneously. Every keystroke is recorded and they're timed. That's rough. And if you are exhausted, and as the day goes on, and as your body heats up, you're having increasing difficulty processing. I've watched people that previously had been employee of the month be fired, and it's not their fault. It's their MS. Cog fog and, and fatigue are the two leading causes of loss of work by people with MS, and they're both invisible. The third most invisible symptom is a symptom that plagues people with MS twice as likely, Stuart's in the room, do not tell him I got off stage, twice as likely as the general population. It's a symptom that actually makes MS get worse faster, and it's a symptom that colors everything gray. Depression, mood. People with MS, for, for neurological reasons, are at double the risk of developing depression. That's very serious, and it's invisible. So when I talk about the nasty triad of symptoms, I'm talking about fatigue, cog fog, and depression. And this lecture is about how to make MS boring. And if we're going to make MS boring, we have to work on all three of those. Now, this is an audience participation question. I need you to pick a number between three and 10. Shout it out. Eight. eight. I'm going to give you eight tips on how to make those things better. And just to up the ante, I'm not going to talk about medicine. All right, let's talk about eight tips to make cog fog, poor energy, and depression better, and I'm not gonna use any medicine. Now, I'm gonna need somebody to keep track so when I get to eight, I know I'm there. You throw a shoe at me. Let's get somebody else to help out. Thank you, thank you, love you. All right, ready? All right, tip number one, get good sleep. What? Seriously, my mom used to tell me that. No, I'm being dead serious. We need sleep. We need eight hours of sleep. Show of hands if you got eight hours of sleep last night. All three of you are very impressive. 
the vast majority of human beings do not budget enough time for sleep. The vast majority of red-blooded Americans wind down the end of their day around 9 or 10 o'clock at night and they put on their nightgown, they sit in front of the boob tube and they watch TV until midnight because they want adult time. I don't wear a nightgown, but I've done that before. I want to just have a little bit of adult time at night. And then they wake up at 6 in the morning. Well, guess what? Midnight to 6, that's not 8 hours, guys. You have to budget time for sleep. There are symptoms in MS that can make sleep difficult. For example, there's a doctor word, nocturia. Nocturia is a doctor word, means I got a pee pee way too often all night long. All right? And so if we're going to sleep okay at night, we have to do something about the nocturia. So one of the things that you do is you drink two thirds of all the water you're going to drink in the first half of the day. And then you stop drinking fluids after the dinner hour. Serious. You make urine for six hours after you drink something. So what time is it? Noon? Watch this. I'm going to make pee-pee until about 7 p.m. right now. All right? And so if you think about that, if you're drinking water as you go to bed and put the bottle of water down by the bedside table when you get in bed, you're going to wake up to go potty. And so if you drink two-thirds of all the water you're going to drink the first half of the day, and then you stop after dinner, now don't walk around going... <laughs> No, don't, I mean, have a sip of water, but, but don't sit there and try to catch up on your fluids because we don't want to make pee-pee at night. So by not drinking enough water in the second half of the day, we're going to sleep better, which is then going to make us improved with regards to fatigue and with regards to cognitive fog. That's one. You got me? So we got to do seven more. Let's get to it. Number two, get a dog. No, I'm being dead serious. Get a dog. Get a pet. If you like gerbils, get a gerbil. We have two ferrets, one American Mastiff, we have a ball python and seven chickens in my house and I live in the city. <laughs> my wife loves herself some animals <laughs> and my kids do too. But I just talk about getting a dog. There are excellent scientific studies that demonstrate that having a pet decreases stress. It forces you to get exercise because you got to get up to let it out. All right. It's a constant companion. It helps reinforce sleep wake cycles and it gives you a friend. And having a dog will improve depression. Having a dog will improve energy levels because of some of those secondary things. Having a dog, which creates a lot of responsibility and things for you to think about, can actually help with cognition. So my second tip, in no particular order, is to have a dog. Let's do another one. We have to pay attention to recreational drugs and alcohol. Right? I'm not telling you to be a teetotaler and never have a bourbon. Don't worry, Matt, I wouldn't do that to you. But I am telling you that alcohol is a sedative hypnotic, all right? And it can have some serious impacts over time if there's too much. A man can digest in his liver two alcoholic beverages a night without any problems to his liver. A gal, typically one. And whereas alcohol by itself might not ruin MS, it impairs the cerebellum. And if you already have trouble with balance, we just have to keep that in mind. Also, the average person with MS takes seven medicines a day. Some of those medicines may interact with alcohol. Alcohol is a depressant and it can impair cognition. It can worsen fatigue. It can make depression worse. I'm again not telling you not to drink alcohol. I'm just pointing out that if you're using a nightcap to help you sleep at night or if you're having your 18th beer that day, we might need to contemplate that's impact on things. All right. That's number three ish kind of. All right. Now, let's talk about medicines that your doctor gives you. Doctors are trained to give people medicines. But you know what we're not trained to do? Stop medicines. Did you notice that? Doctors are the bomb diggity at saying, try this pill, sweetheart. But I think every time they give you a new pill, you take one away. I want you to challenge your doctor. So I saw this little, like, hyper balding guy. And he said that if you start a pill, we should stop a pill. Which pill can I stop? Sometimes the way that I make you better is I scrutinize your medical list. Why are you on this medicine? Ring. How long you been on it? Ring. What's it for? Ring. Well then maybe we shouldn't be on it anymore. I am not telling you to stop your own medicines, all right? Because certain medicines have to be stopped in a certain manner and I don't want to put you at risk. I am telling you to push on your nurse practitioner or your physician's assistant or your MS doctor and say, do I still need this one? Because I've moved three times <clears throat> since I started that medicine and I'm not sure I need it anymore. And you will find that oftentimes, I find oftentimes that we can cut a medicine in half. 
we can switch a medicine or stop a medicine. And polypharmacy, which is where you take too many medicines, can impact cognition. It can make you tired. It can make you cognitively impaired. Many bladder pills make you not think clearly. That's a fact. Now, bladder is a major issue in MS, and I use a lot of pills to treat bladder, but bladder can impair cognition. There is a PP brain connection there. All right? What number am I on? Four. Four. Number five is exercise. I want you to exercise as part of your lifestyle. People with MS that exercise as part of their lifestyle get worse slower. Allow that to sink in. People with MS that exercise as part of their lifestyle are less disabled down the line. Now, let's just do a quick exercise. I'm going to clone you, right? Now, your wife just said, oh, Lord, make it not true. But let's just pretend that there's now two of you, all right? We have clone A and we have clone B. Clone A, we're going to give days of our lives TV and chocolate cake, right? Clone B, we're going to give a treadmill and carrots. And we're going to wait five years and get back together. Now, there's two versions of you. We've got a Greek god, clone B. He's in shape. He's got a strong core. He's got excellent cardiovascular fitness. He is flexible. His balance is better. His legs are strong. Clone A knows everything there is to know about days of our lives. <clears throat> Clone A is an aficionado of chocolate cake. Clone A is deconditioned, out of shape, put on the weight that Clone B lost. Clone A doesn't have strong legs. Cardiovascular, really not there. All right? And then I'm going to get out a Harry Potter magic wand. You didn't know I had one. And I'm going to cast a spell of a left leg attack where your left leg gets weak. Bam! Clone B is limping to work. Clone A is sitting in a wheelchair wondering if he'll ever get out. Do you see what I did there? I deconditioned Clone A and I prehabilitated Clone B. I won't insult you by asking you the obvious question of who you'd like to be. Now, some of you are saying, well, that's just lovely, Mr. Aaron. How in the hey, hey, am I supposed to exercise? And I'm not saying it's easy. And I am not suggesting to you that you just go to a fitness place and pay Biff a bunch of money. And he has you stand on a balance ball and, and do curls. I am suggesting that we have to work very hard to find a way to achieve fitness with MS. And I'm going to give you a pro tip. You ready for a pro tip? Yes. yes. My pro tip is water is your friend. Water's your friend. If you get in a pool and you get overheated, water pulls the heat off your body by convection. If you're off balance and you fall to the left, water pushes to the right. Right? If you have a weak leg and it's hard to pick it up, you weigh less than the water. Water is magic. And I'm going to tell you a quick story about a man that was very special to me. He was very special to me. Not when I had him as my algebra teacher in eighth grade or ninth grade but when he became my MS patient with primary progressive MS years later. He was a tall man. He was a, he was a really, I mean, I'm tall, but this guy was really tall. And why are you laughing? And he was getting worse. He was having increasing difficulty using his walker. He was falling. The family had purchased a wheelchair. He was using it on longer distances. And he came to me with a conversation about giving up walking. And I wasn't ready yet. And so I gave him a challenge. I said, I want you to put on a life jacket. I want you to get in the pool at the YMCA with your walker, and I want you to do laps. And he did. He went to the YMCA. He got a walker in the swimming pool with a life jacket, and he did laps in the swimming pool. He came back to see me three months later, and the MA said, Dr. B, he won't do his testing until you come out in the hallway. So I come out in the hallway. He says, young man, are you ready? He picked up his walker, and he walked 25 feet. That's not make-believe, that's a person that I had the honor to take care of. This was in an era where we couldn't treat primary progressive MS. He did that by exercise. You feel me? What number are we on? I have finished five, you're on six. Six, we're on six. We're almost on the home stretch. Aren't you glad you didn't say 10, we'd be here tonight and I'd still be rattling off a few things that might help with cognition, that might help with depression, that might help with energy levels? The next thing to talk about with energy levels is avoiding naps. Let me explain what I mean. Oftentimes, we fall into a pattern with our sleep, particularly when we're not working, where our, our sleep cycle starts to shift later and later. And everyone else goes to bed, and now it's time to play on the interwebs, right? 
and you get on the interwebs and you play your video games and you do your search around on Facebook, there's nothing wrong with Facebook. And you start to get tired and go to bed around 6 a.m. when your spouse is getting up to go to work. You feel me? This happens very, very commonly. And people will sleep through the daytime, waking up around 3 or 4 p.m., and they've shifted their sleep cycle. That contributes to cognitive impairment. That actually contributes to fatigue. That can interfere with your mood a bunch of different ways. For example, never seeing the sun. And sometimes, it's not that severe, but sometimes we'll take a nap for four and a half hours in the middle of the day. That's not a nap, that's sleeping. You've broken up your sleep cycle. And so what I recommend is that when you wake up and you want to, I recommend that you wake up when the rest of the family wakes up. All right, so that's 6 a.m., 7 a.m., 8 a.m. I recommend you wake up when other people wake up. And Aaron's rule, remember when I say rule, nobody listens. Aaron's rule is you wake up, you're not allowed to go back to bed. The door to the bedroom closes, that room is off limits to you. Right, we're not going back to bed. And I recommend that you stay out of the bedroom during the daytime hours. I also recommend that you go to bed at the same time every night. And I would like that to be roughly around the time your family goes to bed. If you take my advice, you will not like Dr. B because it is very hard. It takes three to four weeks of consistently doing this to reschedule your sleep cycle. But if you do it, something magical happens because you start to be awake when other people are awake, which means when your girlfriend asks if you would like to come with her to have lunch, you're awake to do that, which means if you need to run an errand or make a phone call for the plumber, you can do that, which means you're awake when your spouse is awake or when your kid is awake or when your partner's awake so you can spend some time together. That improves energy levels. That improves fatigue, actually, and that most certainly can help with depression. You feel me? All right, what are we on now? Seven. Number seven. We only have two more. I'm going to think of two while I have a little sip of water. <laughs> Talking to other human beings is really, really important. There is a plague in multiple sclerosis called social isolation. Social isolation has been studied, and it's actually extremely prevalent in MS, where people, for various reasons, withdraw from life. And withdrawing from life worsens cognition. It's true. Withdrawing from life worsens energy levels. Withdrawing from life makes us not think as clearly, to be honest with you. And so I want you to talk to other human beings. Now, if it's very hard for you to get out of your home because of motoric difficulties, thank goodness gracious, we have the interwebs. I, this weekend, am looking forward to, I've been looking forward to it all week, I'm gonna do a live stream where I'm gonna talk about supplements and multiple sclerosis. And I draw energy from that experience because a couple hundred people are going to jump online from all over the globe. And there's a live chat and we interact and we talk and we share and we learn and we love. And I want that for you. And if you can't do that by going out of the house, there's a gazillion ways to do that on the interwebs. Talking and interacting with other human beings is very, very powerful medicine. Number eight is a challenge. I'm going to challenge everyone in this room to do something that I call non-talk therapy. Non-talk therapy is number eight. And non-talk therapy is a way to combat the evil, invisible symptom of depression, cog fog, and pathologic fatigue. I challenge you to identify a weekly activity that is not for your health, so going to the doctor or the physical therapist doesn't count. It's not for your job, and it's not for your family, like running errands, like going to the grocery store. It needs to not be on your schedule. It needs to be an activity that's going to happen whether you go or not. I'll give you an example. Wednesday at noon, YMCA, underwater basket weaving. All right, that's my example. I want you to sign up for underwater basket weaving Wednesdays at noon at the YMCA. And if you sign up for underwater basket weaving at the YMCA at noon on Wednesday, it'll change your entire life. Let me explain why. Tuesday night is no longer a normal Tuesday night. Because Tuesday night, you have to go get your supplies. You have to make sure that you have all the basket weaving materials and that your two-piece that you were very proud of last season still fits you. You have to get all that ready. You have to secure the ride that you're going to use the next day. You have to get all that stuff ready. Wednesday morning is a completely different morning at your house 
because all the chores that you are going to do during the course of the day, you have to cram it all in the first half of the day. Because at 11 p.m. or a.m., you're getting picked up by a ride to go to the YMCA. And at noon, you find yourself underwater with a scuba gear weaving a freaking basket. <laughs> now, Wednesday night at dinner is a completely different dinner. Because as you're sitting there reviewing your day, you say, honey, guess what? I made this. And there's an entire conversation surrounding the God's eye technique for making an Appalachian basket. I've done this. <laughs> and you know what? The entire time, you weren't able to reflect on the fact that you have a chronic condition. Now, you don't have to do underwater basket weaving. You could be involved in a Bible study. You could be involved in a book group. You could be an usher at your church. My point is, I challenge you to participate in non-talk therapy. Do we hit eight? We Can I get an amen? amen? All right. Now, I told you that in this lecture, I was going to teach you how to make MS boring. I said there were three ways to make MS boring. The first we talked about was identifying and treating a relapse. The second was treating symptoms. And I opted to talk about the invisible symptoms. Honey, you look so good. Specifically about depression, cognitive impairment, and energy levels. The third way that we make MS boring is we treat the condition. We slow the disease down. Disease modifying therapies with an S because there are multiple modalities for slowing down MS. And I want to teach all of them to you. And I'm going to teach them all to you using a cutesy saying that I made up. I want you to be four for four in your fight against MS. I want you to be four for four in your fight against MS. Say it with me. Four for four in your fight against MS. There are four things that I'm aware of that slow down multiple sclerosis. Guess how many I want you to do? Four. All four. That's not asking too much. Come on, we got an extra finger if we ever needed it. Number one to slow down MS is to exercise as part of your lifestyle. Yeah, I said it twice. Deal with it. Exercise slows down MS. If you exercise as part of your lifestyle, this has been studied, you're less disabled 20 years later. Did you understand what I just said? If you exercise now, you're less disabled 20 years later. When I'm talking to a young gun, in by the way, do you know what a young gun is? A young gun is a 20-something boy that thinks if he was hit by a car, he dirt the car. Now, every gentleman in this room just shook their head internally because we gentlemen remember when we were young guns. And I would strut across the streets. I dare you. I double dog dare you to hit me. You know, I'd walk real slow, maybe bend down, tie my shoe. I'm not a young gun anymore. I wait for the car to go by. But when I'm talking to a young gun in clinic, I will sometimes tell him, I don't want to talk to you at 20. You at 20 doesn't need me, you would think. I need to channel the 55-year-old you into this room right now because he needs to be here. He wants you to listen to me. And he is begging you to stay physically fit because he doesn't want to be disabled down the line. Being four for four in your fight against MS, it ain't easy. I wish it was. But the first part is to exercise as part of your lifestyle. Now, I shared with you a pro tip of exercising in water, and not everybody has access to a pool. Your friendly neighborhood neurophysical therapist will help you come up with an exercise program you can do at home. You guys have heard of the interwebs? You have anybody ever heard of the interwebs? Yes. Yeah, some of you. All the people on Facebook have. And you can get on the interwebs and you can turn on for free a yoga video. You can do yoga in a chair for free on the interwebs. So you cannot tell me that you have no access to exercise unless you don't have the interwebs. And if that's the case, come talk to me afterwards and we'll try to figure out something else. All right. So in being four for four, say it with me, four for four in your fight against MS, the second thing we want to do is pay attention to, to diet. Diet matters. Diet matters a whole lot. Now, we could talk about diet for about 17 years, all right? But Stuart won't let me do that, and you probably have plans tomorrow morning. So I'm only going to say a couple words about diet. Number one, if you have a low level of vitamin D, it actually increases your risk to develop MS. And if you have a low level of vitamin D at the time of diagnosis, it correlates with getting worse faster. I'm of the opinion that supplementing low levels of vitamin D up into a normal range slows the disease process. I am not telling you to leave here, go to Kroger's and buy a mess of vitamin D and take it. That's not at all what I'm telling you. I am telling you that I want your clinician to check your vitamin D level 
And if it's low, I want them to supplement with D3, not two, three, because it's better absorbed in the body. And we're not taking a certain amount of vitamin D to take it. We're taking it to drive the level up into a normal range, which in MS is above 50 and below 100, right? Now, that's one aspect of diet. But I'm going to give you some serious diet advice as I suck in my gut and turn to my best side for the camera. <laughs> I'm going to give you some diet advice. I am of the opinion, I'm of the, it's just an opinion, but you're stuck listening to me, so I'm allowed, that we should avoid processed foods, we should avoid fast foods, and we should avoid sugar-laden foods. This is not scientifically proven yet, although there are studies that support what I'm saying. It's been my anecdotal experience taking care of over 3,000 families with MS for almost 15 years, that when my patients avoid fast food and soda, when they avoid foods that have ingredients they can't pronounce, they have more energy and they fare better. Now that is a hard thing to do. That means you have to shop only on the outside of the supermarket. That means that you can't get a quick frozen pizza. I challenge you when you go home, read the ingredients on what you're eating. If you can't pronounce the words, that's not food. No, I'm being serious. If you buy a burger at a fast food joint, this is another experiment, go home and buy a burger, don't eat it, just bring it home, unpackage it and set it on the shelf. Come back two years later, guess what it looks like? A burger. It didn't rot. Food is supposed to rot. That's not food. It looks like food, but it's not. All right, enough about number two, which was talking about diet, all right? I said that there's four things that I want you to do to be four for four in your fight against MS. I said the first one was to exercise as part of your lifestyle. I said the second one had to do with diet. The third one's not to smoke. Did you guys know, show of hands, that smoking increases the risk to get MS? Yep, it almost doubles your risk to get MS. Raise your hand if you didn't know, raise your hand if you did not know, that if you have MS and smoke, it speeds up your disease almost by 50%. Did you feel me? If you smoke, it speeds up your disease by almost 50%. There are MS therapies that cannot lower the disease by 50%. And for six bucks a day, for a limited time only, you can speed up your disease by almost 50% just by smoking cigarettes. I am not suggesting it's easy to quit smoking. In fact, I know as gospel truth, it's very hard to quit smoking. But I don't want you to have disability. I don't want you to get worse. And you can speed up your disease by smoking cigarettes. And so if you are someone who's smoking and you have left the pre-contemplative phase, which is talk to the hand doc, and you entered into the maybe doc phase, the, the contemplative phase, bring that to the attention of your clinician. I'll, I'll tell you a secret you'll make your doctor's day. It is a joy. It almost makes me tearful when someone comes in and says, Doc, can I have some help quitting smoking? Because we can help you quit smoking. We can do that. And here's the best part. If you quit smoking, it slows your disease down. Doesn't that sound nice? Yes. Can I get an amen? amen? Now, number four in four for four to treat MS is to take an MS medicine. And I could talk for a couple years about MS medicines. All right? It's a big portion of my job as a neuroimmunologist to alter the immune response, to knock it off, to not attack the holiest of holies, the supercomputer that runs the body. I'm just going to give you a couple tenets, all right? I want you to go on the single most effective medicine you're comfortable with as quickly as possible. And I want you to take that medicine until you die. Someone asked earlier, do I have to keep taking a medicine? And I ask you a question in return. I have high cholesterol. Thanks, Dad. How long am I supposed to take a cholesterol medicine? Do I take it till I'm 70, say it was a good life and stop? No, because if I stop my cholesterol medicine, I increase my risk of heart attack and stroke. You have, if you have MS, an aberrant immune response. Your immune system took a wrong turn. It thinks that part of your body is a foreign invader. And I don't want you to stop your MS medicine. I feel very passionately about that. Now, if you think back to what I said a second ago, I want you to take the single most effective drug you can that you're comfortable with. Now that doesn't mean that every single person is going to be on the most effective medicine because they're not comfortable with it. This is where we have to be partners. I read books you didn't read. That doesn't make me better than you. It doesn't make me smarter than you. It just means I read some stuff you didn't read. You know your body better than anyone else because it's yours. That makes us one heck of a good team. 
because you bring your knowledge about you and I bring the books that I read to the table and then we have a conversation. And I want you to go on the most effective drug that you're comfortable with. Remember in Cincinnati, they didn't teach me how to be paternal where I get to tell you what's right for you? I do not get to do that. I have the ethical obligation to educate you, to explain to you why I think this is the best fit, the good, the bad, the ugly. I need to teach you the risk benefit of the drug inside the context of the disease. And then I need to shepherd you as we make this decision. I want you to be four for four in your fight against MS. Say it with me. Four for four in your fight against MS. And part of that is taking an MS medicine. My name is Aaron Boster, and it has been an honor to talk to you about MS today. Thank you for learning with me. Thank you so much. Stuart's not in the room. <laughs> na, 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 na. All right. I think we can take some questions. Anybody have any questions? We're going to get a microphone, hold on to your questions, and we're going to answer some questions. Who has the first question? Bueller. Bueller. Anybody? I know someone who has been diagnosed as having benign MS. They are not on a disease modifying therapy. Do you think they still need to be on one? So we share that someone has benign multiple sclerosis. They're not on an MS medicine. Do they need to be on a therapy? What does benign MS and the tooth fairy have in common? Neither are real. Benign MS is BS. And I can prove it to you. A third of people with a benign MS diagnosis go on to have aggressive disease. Benign MS definition does not take into consideration cognition, the leading cause of loss of work from MS. Benign MS definition doesn't take into consideration accelerated brain volume loss. MS is MS. And if you are fortunate enough to have a benign variant early on, that doesn't mean you're going to win that game. I want to stack the deck in your favor. You don't have to take birth control to not get pregnant. You might get lucky. What do we call a gal that doesn't take birth control? Mom. Mom. <laughs> All right, and so if you don't mind maybe getting, having a kid, continue to not use birth control and just roll the dice and see what happens with your sixth child. I would rather you continue to believe you have benign MS while taking a medicine. Worst case scenario, you have side effects from that medicine. I respect that. But if the flip side's true, and you get neurologically disabled and lose your job and can't provide for your family or do things that you want to do, I'm not going to tell you, ha ha, I was right. I'm going to cry with you. And so that's the answer. Thank you for the question. Well, my question was, you were saying how people should be on a medication, but sometimes, no matter which 16 or 17 of the drugs that are out there, your activities of daily living will be compromised. It's impossible to do work. And you're, you know, you're steady running. I mean, all of them cause similar, um, the, side, the side effects of those medications. I have been an MS doctor for almost a decade and a half. I have treated thousands of families with MS. How many times have I failed in getting someone on an MS medicine? Zero. So I challenge you. I have failed zero times finding something someone can tolerate. I ain't saying it's easy breezy cover girl. I ain't saying that you're guaranteed for a limited time only for $9.99 if you sign up now to have the perfect drug with no side effects that makes you sexier, you can do things you've never done before. What I'm telling you is this is a rough hand that someone was dealt. And we want to make you the most awesome version of you despite having MS. And we may have to compromise on some things in order to get us on a therapy that we can tolerate. We may have to accept certain things in order to be on an MS medicine. And I'm not suggesting it's easy, not at all, but it's really, really important. Well, I challenge that by saying MS is still, because there are all these medications out there, it really doesn't have the research and the studies that other uh, illnesses have so therefore we don't know if we're I mean they said I went to one doctor he was saying well if that doesn't work try something else 
I if am, all of those drugs are in your system, so how much can a person take after I, trying 10 drugs? What do you do? I am delighted that you're wrong. With respect, there is tremendous amounts of research supporting the fact that MS medicines can slow down this disease. I am not suggesting that it's easy. I recognize that it's hard. But it's a fight that if you want, I will fight with you as a team. Only if you want. I don't make people do things they don't want to do. But I would not be doing my job as someone who has dedicated his life to beating up on MS if I didn't work with you to the extent that you're willing to try to find something to work to slow your disease down. And I have, I recently looked through this. I've done 65 clinical trials in my career. I participated in 65 clinical trials to look into MS medicines. There's a lot of research out there. And I, I impress upon you the desire to try to do better. Question here. Yeah. Um, I know someone that has both Parkinson's and MS. Me too. And her Parkinson's doctor is recommending that she not take MS meds. Um, any thoughts on that? Oh, I have a lot of thoughts, but I'll, <laughs> I'll only share a few. You know, if you got a plumber to come to your house to install the sink you picked out, and the plumber said that that's not a nice sink, that he didn't like the color, you get a different sink, you get a different plumber. Right, because you didn't hire the plumber to comment on your taste level or the sink that you like. You hired a plumber to install the darn sink. And so I think that we have to keep in mind who's in charge of your body. You are. And if you had a classic 1966 hardtop Corvette and it was the dream car of your life and you took it to a mechanic and the mechanic said, oh, we have to replace your engine. The first thing you would do is you would get a second opinion because you might not want to replace that engine. And so if a doctor's telling you something, whatever that is, that doesn't jive, I think it's reasonable to get a second opinion. I have patients that have MS and Parkinson's. I work with Parkinson specialists. We have never, ever, ever needed to stop treatment. Feel me? Thank you for the question. Uh-oh, now wait a second. When Jill asks a question, it is typically hardcore. I just found this water. I didn't know it was there. Jill, let me just prepare myself emotionally. <laughs> Hit me. Most, if not all, of our MS medications slow progression at this point, or intend to slow progression. What about a fix for MS? So Jill asks an outstanding question, as per her usual. And I dream of a world where people don't know what it means to have MS. That's the world I dream about. If I could do that, I would. I stand before you very humbly, telling you that we are farther along than we've ever been in our ability to impact this disease, slow down progression. Sometimes we can halt it for periods of years. I don't know how to fix it yet, but I'm not done trying. What I do think is very feasible in the modern era is to make MS boring and to help you be the best version of you possible despite having the disease. We don't have a fix yet. I want one. I promise you, I want one, just as bad as you do. Thank you for the question. Next questions. Pre-designed. All right. Biomarkers. Woo! Bio what's a biomarker? A biomarker is a way of assessing how you're doing. A blood pressure is a biomarker. That information teaches you about your cardiovascular system. If you draw some blood laboratories and it tells you about your diabetes, that's a biomarker. The number one biomarker in MS, outside of what you tell us, what we see on exam, is the MRI. That's a very expensive, claustrophobic inducing biomarker, right? But I am super duper excited to share with you that on the horizon, very, very soon, literally, we will have a blood test biomarker. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of neurofilament light chain. Some of you have heard of neurofilament light chain. Neurofilament light chain is really neat. You know in the brain you got the neurons, those are the cells of the brain. When you crack a neuron because of anything, trauma, stroke, MS, the insides of the neuron, the axons, they leak out. And they include heavy chains, medium chains, and light chains. Neurofilament light chain goes up when there's neuronal damage. It's not specific for MS, but if you have MS, neurofilament light chain goes up nine months before an attack. 
If you have MS, neurofilament light chain goes up when you're progressing in your disease. If you have MS and you take an MS medicine, it lowers your neurofilament light chain. We have had access to neurofilament light chain by doing spinal taps for almost 10 years. That is not feasible. I can't do a spinal tap every three months. Nobody would come back and see me. <laughs> um, but we now have the ability to draw blood and measure neurofilament light chain. And it is almost commercially available. I think in the next couple years, we will have neurofilament light chain as a blood test to monitor MS, hopefully predict upcoming attacks, and to assess response to medication. That is not make-believe, that is not science fiction, that is on the very near horizon. Really exciting biomarker. Great. You answered one of my questions already, you took care of neuro. All right, neurofilament. Now I'm on this side of the room, so it looks like you we're getting a question over here, right? Stem cell therapy. That's what I thought Jill was gonna ask. Stem cell therapy. Stem cell therapy sounds sexy. Stem cell therapy sounds really, really cool. I simply take out some stem cells, put them on ice, and then I ablate your immune response and I give you back your stem cells and you don't have your autoimmune condition anymore. That sounds awesome. It's not that straightforward. Stem cell therapy is a hard reset of your immune response. If I use a computer analogy, if you have a computer virus, a stem cell therapy is I open up the CPU, I remove the motherboard and I throw it out and I install a new motherboard. Stem cell therapy deserves to be studied in MS. And there are amazing clinical trials going on today studying stem cell therapy in MS. I think that stem cell therapy will become part of the MS armamentarium within the next 10 years. Presently, I implore upon you, I beg you not to fall prey to tourist stem cell therapy. It is a plague in the United States. The American FDA is cracking down hard, thank goodness gracious, because there are charlatans around the world in exotic places like India, Mexico, and Chicago that for $25,000 will swap out your bone marrow. And a stem cell therapy is hardcore. It makes every MS medicine look like a joke. And I'm not saying it's wrong, I'm saying that it's intense and that right now, we only wanna do stem cell therapy in the context of safe research studies. It will become a thing, I do believe that, in the very near future, but it's not prime time yet. I have a friend named Dr. Mark Friedman. He's a great man, he's wonderful. He's real tall like me. He's in Ottawa, Canada, and he has done one of the most extensive stem cell research trials in the world. He took about 28 of the worst of the worst relapsing young MS patients and did stem cell therapy. And 70, 80% had quiet disease and only one died. We're not ready yet. It's not prime time, but it's close to. It's really close and it's exciting. Thank you. Um, what's your opinion about anti-inflammatory diets and turmeric? I love that. Turmeric is delicious, right? I mean, turmeric's a delicious spice. Um, she's asking about anti-inflammatory diets. There are no diets on earth that have been proven to slow MS. Allow me to repeat myself. There are no diets on earth that are proven to slow multiple sclerosis. Now, wait a second, Aaron. Didn't you say like four sentences ago that diet was important? It's very, very important. But I don't want you to think that you can take a magic diet that will make your MS go away, because that's not true. And when people talk about anti-inflammatory, it may not be anti-inflammatory in the brain or the spinal cord. Diet is important. There is a famous MS diet called the swank diet, and it's swanky. All right, you're supposed to eat almost no red meat, and you can only have a little tiny bit of fish or chicken, and it's a very, very high um, content of legumes and other uh, vegetables and fruits it's considered an anti-inflammatory diet, and it's been studied, and the epidemiologic data does not look like it slows MS at all. It's very murky data, it's actually very hard to study. It might help with energy levels. Here's my take on diet. We know that unchecked cardiovascular disease makes MS get worse faster. 
a heart healthy diet where you avoid heavy saturated fats and you avoid sugar laden foods and you make healthy choices and you eat foods that have lots of colors and multigrains, that's a healthy diet. That's good for all people in this room and I think it's doubly good if you have MS. Diet is a hot topic. I made plenty of YouTube videos on diet because I care a lot about it. But I don't want you to leave the room and say that there's this magic diet which will replace my need for an MS medicine and it's going to make me better. I want to do things, I want to use every tool possible to slow down your MS. Thank you for the question. Another, another question back here first, then I'll get to that person, then I'll get to you all. Marijuana, another exotic subject. Do you have any? <laughs> no, 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 sorry, it was a question. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Marijuana, ganja, cannabis, cannabinoids, pot, Mary Jane, weed. Acapulco gold. So, so I have uh, done a lot of presentations this year on studying cannabinoids and MS. Right? It's, it's a hot topic. I mean, if there ever was one, it's a very hot topic. And when I look at the, met the scientific data supporting its use in MS, it's actually very poor. Now, hear me out. I have many patients who I trust and believe that tell me that if they smoke a little weed, it helps with their spasticity and their pain. And I don't think they're lying to me. I don't think they're lying to me. But I'll be honest, the science is not there. When you look at the scientific studies, there's a paucity of evidence. Again, that doesn't mean it's not true, it just means it hasn't been studied and we desperately need new studies. Also, sometimes we talk about the, the potential presumed benefits of marijuana, but we don't talk about the fact that if you smoke a joint, you increase your risk of heart attack by 5.4% for the next two hours. 5.4 times. It skyrockets that risk of heart attack, just like it would with a cigarette. And sometimes people don't talk about that, right? My point here is everything is a risk benefit. Am I telling you that you should never go home and have a little weed? No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm simply saying I, it's my job to tell you when there is and isn't evidence for something. And presently, there is not adequate scientific evidence. Just because you put the word medical in front of toaster doesn't mean it's a medical toaster. <laughs> I have a patient who is from this town. Great guy. Really, really bad MS. Great guy. He said, hey, Dr. B. Do a lot of patients tell you that, that marijuana makes them feel better? I said, yeah. He said, do a lot of patients tell you that it helps their MS? And I said, yeah. He goes, can I be honest with you? I really like to get high. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I really appreciated that comment. Next question. Um, I just had a question pertaining to the MRI. You have to get in the machine and you, you have to get in this you know, it's dreadful, <laughs> but I was asking about the contrast. Is there, has there been any studies done? What does that do to the body? Yes, there's been a lot of studies. I have a YouTube video on that as well. So that was a great question. She says, as it relates to the MRI, and they give you that contrast dye halfway through the scan, they pull you out and they inject you, and you think you're going to wet your pants in the scanner? You get that flushed feeling? The contrast is a chelating agent. It stays inside the bloodstream. It's not supposed to leak out of the bloodstream. If it leaks out of the bloodstream into the brain parenchyma, it lights up new lesions, new like now. So the contrast agent teaches us about time. It teaches us whether a, a white spot on the brain is new. MRI is the most powerful biomarker presently available to treat MS and to monitor MS and to monitor response to therapy. And I find that an MRI with contrast teaches me more than without. I'm not saying that an MRI without contrast is useless. It's not. It's very, very useful. But I learn more if we give contrast. Now, there are two medical concerns, excuse me, as it relates to contrast. Number one, it's tough on the kidneys. And so if you have kidney dysfunction, you have to be very cautious having contrast. Oftentimes in healthcare systems, we actually will check your blood to look at your kidney function prior to giving you an MRI to make sure it's safe. And if you have kidney dysfunction, you need to be cautious. You want to let your doctor know, I'm in stage one kidney failure. You want to make sure that you're not uh, giving contrast airy-fairy. Number two, certain types of contrast sequester in the brain. Sequester is a doctor word for get trapped. Certain kinds of contrast get stuck. Certain kinds don't. Let me give you a pro tip. If your 
MRI machine is using a linear, linear contrast molecule, that's bad. Linear contrast molecules are bad because they stay in the, in the brain. Macrocyclic, cyclic like a circle, macrocyclic molecules are not sequestered in the brain. And so you want to make sure that you're getting an MRI with contrast using macrocyclic molecules. Most places around the country don't use linear contrast anymore. That's a great question. Thank you for asking it. Other questions? Next. We've got three of them over here. Good deal. Is it a fact that there is a predisposition to MS but not a predetermination? And if that is the case, have they developed any genetic testing for it? That's an excellent question. And so the, really the core of that question is what causes MS? So, so the answer is we don't know. All right, but I can give you a slightly more elaborate, we don't know. All right, I'll, I'll give you the party line in 2019. It breaks down like this. People, thank you, people who trace their ancestry back to a given part of the world tend to share pools of genes. Not Levi's genes, like genes that make up our body, right? And so if you trace your ancestry back to Northern and Western Europe, as a population, those people tend to share similar genes, including the genes that code for the immune response. And if you want to be scientific, I'm talking about HLA receptor type stuff, all right? Now, if you trace your ancestry back to these areas, there's genetic variants that predispose people to be more likely to develop autoimmunity, not MS, but autoimmunity, compared to other areas. That doesn't mean that every pasty white person is gonna have MS or an autoimmune condition. It means that if you trace your ancestry back to Northern or Western Europe, that you may share a pool of genes that predisposes the population to have more autoimmunity. We then believe that there are environmental factors pre-puberty that increase or decrease a given individual's risk to develop MS. And I'll share a couple with you. Number one, smoking. Smoking increases an individual's risk to develop MS. Secondhand smoke does as well. Let that sink in. Low levels of vitamin D. We remarked that there's a lot of MS north of the equator. There's also not very much sun north of the equator. For example, in Cincinnati, Ohio. And if you don't have a lot of sun, you don't have a lot of vitamin D, and if you have a low level of vitamin D, it increases the risk to develop MS. I can go on with several other environmental risk factors, but those alter the predisposition genetically. That's not enough. Otherwise, every pasty white kid in Cincinnati that smokes a cigarette would get an autoimmune disease. That's not true. We then believe that there's a mistake with the immune response, where the immune system is going after a virus, the most commonly discussed virus is the kissing disease, EBV or mono. And the immune system tries to build an arsenal against mono. And that arsenal, by accident, identifies the brain and spinal cord as a foreign invader. And so it's actually a very complex answer. Uh, we're learning about it every day. We're not there yet, but that's the state of the art in 2019. Is it true that they find that people uh, are probably known to have MS by 15 for later in life? I don't know. It's very hard, Stu, to work backwards and figure out age of onset. If we prospectively got MRIs in everyone every year, we might be able to do a better job. I have a friend named Brenda Banwell, and she is a, a wizard. She's actually she's a doctor, but she's kind of a wizard. And she does a lot of studies in pediatric multiple sclerosis. She's been doing research in pediatric MS for her whole career tr because if a kid gets MS, they've had it less time than if an adult gets MS. And she's looked at, for example, enumerate different viruses and various things. She hasn't yet found an answer. So I, I think we don't know just yet. It's a great question. You talked about marijuana, but what about CBD oil? Because ah. every friend I have and relative Want thinks I should be using it. Yes. Yeah. So, so let's talk about cannabinoids. Cannabinoids are chemicals that bind in the body to cannabinoid receptors. Cannabinoids, there's, there's hundreds upon hundreds of different cannabinoids. The most commonly discussed cannabinoids are THC and CBD. THC is a cannabinoid that binds to the CB1 receptor. The CB1 receptor is found in the brain. And so if you ingest C THC and it binds to the CB1 receptor in the brain, you get high. 
It has psychedelic effects. CBD doesn't bind to the CB1 receptor. It binds to the CB2 receptor. And there are no CB2 receptors in the brain, none. You can't get high off CBD. It's not physically possible. CBD binds to the CB2 receptor, which is found on immune cells and may have some inclination of anti-inflammatory effect. CBD today in Ohio is not illegal. It's, it's legal. You can't get high off of it. It's not a controlled substance as of yet. And anecdotally, anecdotally, CBD is the bomb diggity in helping with pain and spasticity and other things. I have meticulously reviewed the data on CBD and MS. There's almost no studies. And the studies that are done are not scientifically rigorous. I'm not telling you it doesn't help. Right. I have lots of friends and people that I take care of that have used CBD and find it to be helpful. And I believe them. I don't think they're making it up. But I can't look you in the eyes and tell you that for a limited time, only for $9.99, if you take this CBD oil, it's going to do X or Y because the science isn't there just yet. Um, do you think it's harmful? Uh, so, so she says, well, is it harmful? To my knowledge, CBD is not harmful. But wait, CBD is not regulated by the FDA, which means when you go to the store and buy CBD oil, you're not guaranteed what's in it. And I just throw that out there because you, you might not be getting what you think you're getting. And so there is a potential risk there. Just throwing that out there. Excellent question. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to just back up for a minute. And right, well, we, on, talked, <laughs> we talked about the neurofilament um, light chains hmm? and, you know, spinal tap or lumbar puncture. Yep. Other than ease, you know, it's easier to go on somebody's arm for blood as opposed to somebody's um, spinal, fluid? spinal cord. Is there any difference? I mean, is it, will it be more predictive? Will it be easier to see whether there's MS? Excellent question. Thank so you. So she says there's this, this neurofilm of light chain, Aaron. You said that you could test it in the spinal fluid through a lumbar puncture, or you could draw blood. And the concentration of neurofilm light chain in the spinal fluid is way higher than the concentration in the blood. But the studies that were presented as recently as a year ago prove that they're reliable. And so even though the concentrations are lower, we can very accurately monitor the levels looking in the blood. We don't need to look in the spinal fluid. And when I look at the clinical trials, I don't think we're losing anything by going with blood and not spinal fluid. Oh, I'll be there. I just can't. I had a question though because when I was first I or you know they were working on the diagnosis and we did a lumbar puncture and it was kind of you know they weren't really sure so my question would be would it be so more absolutely. prevalent so, in a blood test so when you um, have neurological symptoms and go to the neurologist and are being evaluated for possible MS we do a series of tests we take a history we do an examination and we typically get an MRI, and sometimes we get a lumbar puncture. But the, the stuff we're looking for in the lumbar puncture has nothing to do with neurofilm light chain. It's looking for a different set of tests. Neurofilm light chain will not diagnose MS. It's not specific for MS. And when we're talking about a lumbar puncture to diagnose MS, we're talking about a different set of tests. IgG index and oligoclonal bands. And that's a, that's a different discussion. But I have a YouTube video on it. <laughs> Maybe you covered this, but is there a way now, I thought I read or heard, they can predict MS through the eye, looking in the eye? So there's a lot of new and exciting technology. Uh, there's a test that I'm very fond of called OCT, Ocular Coherence Tomography. Say that fast three times. Ocular hearing tomography. Ocular hearing tomography. Ocular hearing tomography. It's actually a funny word. And you can't diagnose MS with an OCT by itself. But there's a paper that came out this past week, actually, on Monday, that showed that, that OCT gets us closer to a diagnosis after optic neuritis. I'm not aware of a, a, a singular eye test that guarantees an MS diagnosis. But there's a lot that we can learn about by looking in the eye. Think about this. You got your eyeball like to pretend my fist is your eyeball, then you have the optic nerve, and on the other end of the optic nerve is your brain. 
When you shine a light here, you can see part of the central nervous system with an ophthalmoscope. So there's a lot that you can learn about the central nervous system and about MS by, by studying the eye. It's, it's literally a window into your brain. Great questions, guys. Great. Two more. Two more. Hit me. Okay, first one. When is there going to be a repair to the damage done? So when we talk about MS medicines, really, we need three kinds of MS medicines to whoop MS. We need anti-inflammatory medicines. And so every single disease-modifying therapy currently FDA approved, they're all anti-inflammatory medicines. So any of the MS medicines you might name, the C word, the R word, the O word, the T word, they're all anti-inflammatory medicines. That is one of three things that I think we need to really lick the disease. The second thing we need is a neuroprotective agent to protect the neurons. And that doesn't exist. The third thing that we need is a remyelinating agent, something to put the myelin back on the, the axon. And we don't have that yet either, although we're studying several hopeful molecules that in early testing are promising. We're not there yet, but we're working on it. Most of the most exciting disease-modifying therapy research going on right now is not in anti-inflammatory molecules. We have some really good ones. It's in neuroprotective and in remyelinating agents. And as we move forward in the next 10 years, that's what we hope to bring to light are those other agents because it's gonna take, in my opinion, all three to beat the disease. All right, next question. I lied, there's two more still. No worries. All right, next one is, uh, when does a doctor like you become a mobile doctor that gets around the country to see so many people? <laughs> so, I look at my friend who has become a grand wizard at understanding the complexities of, of billing and paying and, and, and coverage and all these things. And it's challenging, right? So, so the closest that we've gotten is with telemedicine. Telemedicine. I have a friend that uh, works uh, at one of the best MS centers in the country. He's uh, in Colorado. And he shares that some people in his state travel four hours routinely to get to him. And in the winter, that's almost impossible. And so he's gotten rid of one clinic, and he does telemedicine now. So he only has to get dressed from the waist up, as long as he doesn't stand up. And he gets on a camera, and he does neurological visits that way. And that's happening right now. And so I think that we are getting closer and closer to being able to change the way that we provide care for people. The era of the doctor will see you in six months if he has an appointment, that's dead. Now, we don't all know that yet, but that's, that's really a dead model. That's not the best model. The future of MS Care, Stu, is that we bring the doctor to you. And I think one of the ways that we do that, or will do that, is by leveraging telemedicine. You might say, well, Aaron, why aren't you doing telemedicine right now? To be blunt, there aren't billing codes in Ohio that allow us to do that for MS. Which means I could do that, but I can't bill you. And if you have Medicare, I would commit fraud. And so it, it, it's, it's a barrier that we're working on. It's a barrier that we're working on. Okay, there was gonna be one more, but I got thrown a curveball, so now we got another one again. Let's do it up. Uh, okay, well, we just you just mentioned that neuroprotective and remyelinating are the two things that new drugs moving forward we would need to have for yep. cure, correct? Why would you need neuroprotective if you have remyelinating? I mean, it would be better, I guess, to avoid the damage, but... That's the answer. It, it, ideally, if there's no damage, we don't have to worry about it, but, but realistically, there's gonna be damage. We wanna protect and we wanna remyelinate where the damage has occurred. So it's kind of like, uh, it's kind of like we want to leave anything unchecked. And so if we can decrease inflammation, protect neurons, and remyelinate the ones that lost it, that's the best case scenario. Final question. Final question. I'm coming up for this one. I love that. Did you all learn something today? Yes. Great. That was my final question. And thank you for everything you do. Thanks, guys.